representative uh, Christian uh, Con Conte. Conte. Yep. And it's a uh, representative of District 32. And uh, you're going to talk to us about the legislative process, is my understanding, right? Correct. All right. Well, there you go. Thank you. Thank you. All right. We'll do a quick test. I feel like I've I have a pacemaker hooked up to me. It should be off. All right. All right. Am I live? I didn't do anything. You should. That should be off. All right. Wonderful. Thank you for having me here today. My name is Chris Consett. I represent District 32, and to give you an idea of what District 32, it's one of the smallest districts in the state of South Dakota. I have friends that have districts that have seven counties. In order to have a district, you have to have 35,000 people in the district. My district goes from Omaha to over to Catron. It goes from Highway 79 to Hot Springs up to Skyline Drive. So I can literally walk my district. It's the downtown area, West Boulevard, uh, Star Village, um, all the way out to Minnesota Street in that area where the new Walmart is. Um, once again, thank you for having me here today. I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself and how I got involved in what some people demonize the world of politics. I did it the unconventional way. I was appointed. In 2009, uh, Brian Dreyer, um, who at that time was in the National Guards, was going to be deployed, and he w didn't want to spend the two and a half months that we have to spend in Pierre before he went on a year-long trip over to Iraq. And so Governor Mike Rounds in 2009 called me, and I, 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 I had been courted by David Lust, who uh, used to be majority leader, was a very powerful figure, my attorney, very close to my family, and he asked if I wanted to go on this list, and I said no. Uh, at that point, I had a small home business, and my focus, truly, when people say, what is your job? And I said, I'm a wife and a mother. I, I stay at home. That's what I do. And, and to be quite honest, on the side, I, I created a position where I could stay home. I was a professional grant writer. And I still do dabble in that, um, but I have found that taking this position that... Um, when I'm home, I need to be home. Um, we get invited to tens of thousands of events a year. I mean, if somebody's opened an envelope, they want you there. And so there's a lot. So when I'm not doing things like this, I'm completely focused on being the wife and the mom and the house, that type of thing. Uh, my daughter, Catherine, is in eighth grade at St. Thomas More. So we've been very active out here. I met my husband, Steve, oh gosh, 27 years ago at USD. We've been married for 21 years. Um, so I went on this list and I got a call from the governor and I was on a play date with a friend at Fuddruckers and the governor said I need you to go out to your car I'd like to offer you this position and I started to panic he's like don't drive but I'd like to offer you this position and I was like well I need to talk to my husband and, and, and he said Chris you knew that this was probably coming I assume that you've had the conversation it's not espionage <laughs> it's uh, it's me asking you to commit to go in for 40 days. Now this was on December 3rd. The way the session works is the state of South Dakota, per our constitution, we have to do our business within 40 days. And the way it works is we're usually four days there, three days home. Sometimes we have a five day, but it's usually that's the way it works. And so I accepted the position and I found myself sitting on the house floor with anxiety and um, I just, I didn't even know where the bathrooms were basically. And so I, I got through my first year and I actually had initially turned down the position and my husband came to me and he said, Chris, women never get appointed. And he said, especially women in West River. And he goes, I said, I can't, I don't know how I'm going to make this work. And my best friend, Angie Dietrich, who's very also involved with St. Thomas More and St. Elizabeth Seton, um, came to me and said, I will make a pledge to you to watch Kate for the next nine years. So when you go to Pierre, I will pick her, you know, make sure she gets to school every day. My husband is the president of Wells Fargo, so he does not have leniency in his position. He has to be there. And so she goes, I'll make a pledge. She goes, you need to accept this. And so I did. And I, I marched off to Pierre. I am originally from Fort Pierre. My family still lives there. Uh, Carl and Eileen Fisher are my parents. They own a successful real estate and uh, insurance agency there and throughout the state. So I was raised in the Capitol, but it's quite different from being an intern to the Capitol to where you sit there and the hot glare of the 
light is on you. Um, it's almost like a petri dish in a fishbowl. Um, and so I, I stumbled through my first 40 days because I went from being a housewife and a mom who wrote checks for political people and supported their causes to the next day I was being quizzed, tell me your complete theory on right to life. Tell me your complete theory on Native American grasslands. Uh, I, I, you know, and I just was like, you need to give me a moment to collect my thoughts. And so, thank goodness I have collected my thoughts, and this, I just completed my sixth year there. While I've been there, I have been, well, I'm currently the chair of local government, which means any bill that has anything where they can't define where it needs to go, or anything that affects local counties, cities, comes to my committee. And then I'm also on health and human services. I've been a majority whip which what that means is you have the four big leadership positions and then I call it middle management. There's four of us that manage the rest of the group underneath. Um, but now I'm perfectly content in the position that I have being the chairwoman of a committee. And I, I live in my own little bubble and, and, and it's very stressful. And I, you come home after the 40 days and my family, we usually go on a vacation for a week. And I just said to my husband, after about the third year, you know, you come home and you want, just, you want to sleep. And I'm like, if, if we could just not talk for a week, I love you, I will cook, but I've talked more in 40 days than I talk the entire rest of the year. And it's usually a very high, in a highly demanding um, way, you know, you're debating and you're trying to make your cause, make your pitch, get a hundred, well in my case, 75 other people in the house to agree with why you brought this bill and why it's necessary. I am a person of, um, believes in limited government, so I tend not to bring bills. The bills that I do bring is getting rid of, of, of government, unnecessary government. We have a lot of red tape out there. I'm currently the chairwoman of a summer study, which means we take issues that, um, like the Blue Ribbon Task Force for Education, this study has to do with county funding. Our counties are failing. They are underfunded. And so I've been working on that for about four months. And then we will bring some legislation. And for example, some of the red tape legislation, we have fees and pieces of legislation on the books from 1865. An auditor can charge five cents to sign this document. The auditors didn't even know that. And so we're doing a lot of red tape, cutting funding, things like that there, just getting rid of things that we don't need on the books. I was there um, in 2010 when uh, Dugard had to, or 2011, when Dugard had to make that tough decision about cutting everything 10%. That was very hard vote for me. I have been on those committees um, when it comes to death penalty, uh, abortion, um, a lot of tough issues, a lot of tough issues. And most people, no, no, nobody really cared what I thought before I had a vote. And then it became um, public. It, it has to be public. I am there to represent the District 32 and the citizens of the state of South Dakota. Now, the way I choose to conduct myself there is I have four um, rules. I have to look at myself every day and like who I see looking back at me. That kind of regulates how I vote. Um, I look at myself as being on the state board of directors, so I need to act like it. There are a lot of unprofessional things that go on there, and a lot of, not a lot, but there is... Um, no respect. You're a human being, I'm a human being, we may disagree. Dale Barcher and I have these issues um, where we may disagree, but at least we can have a civil conversation um, on these issues. I always need to remember that I represent my entire district, not just Republicans, and I do represent Democrats. Although I'm a highly Republican district, I, just like I need to be able to have a conversation when we disagree, I need to be able to have a conversation with my constituents. and why I voted this way and you voted me in knowing this about me because I'm very open and then finally that faith must play a role in effectively governing and I believe there can never actually be reform until we embrace and embody faith and family and community again there will we will never have reform in Washington DC because I don't see that coming now thank goodness that in the state of South Dakota we are we're just nice people most majority of the people that I work are, we're nice people. We know when we need to make cuts. We know when we need to fund things. Sometimes we're a little slow at funding things because we're also a very fiscally conservative people. So to the job that I do, 
I'm going to open it up for some questions unless you'd like to meet to explain like what my day is. Okay. What happens is I get up about five o'clock in the morning and I at any time of the day what happens is anybody can write a bill. I had somebody slip me a napkin once and say I want a bill written on this subject. And if I, if I agree with it, what happens is it goes to the Legislative Research Council. And that is our team of attorneys. Now let me explain to you how fiscally conservative we are. I have two employees, my right hand and my left hand. You may get an intern, and that's usually a college kid that, you know, you can say do a little research. We get paid $6,000 a year. A couple years ago I broke down everything that I do for this position in the capacity of this position. I made point zero 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 four cents an hour for this job and I you obviously take it on because you're a little, little bit narcissistic and you enjoy doing thing, these things but I really enjoy serving the state of South Dakota I'll finish out my next three years I have an election next year and then um, I was just telling Dale I believe that God has always has another chapter for me I don't know what it is but I'm sure it'll be revealed in the next three years it'll be something and so I will step down at that time now a bill, what I would do is if I sponsor the bill, it can only be introduced by a senator or a representative. I would take it then to LRC. They would find any statutes that refer to it, or if you're cutting something out, they would rewrite it. And then you get this official document, and it's in a little folder, and you read through it, and if you agree to it, there's a sheet on the front with all of our names. You circle it if you're the prime sponsor. And what that sheet has is you need a prime sponsor in the House and the Senate. And what it does is it lists every senator and every representative's names. And at that time, you go around and you pitch your bill. This is ABC. It's tax cut. And this is why I want it. Now, people at that point get to choose. That's where lobbyists come in. And we have a very respectful lobbying group in Pier. We really do. They have access to you, what is it, Dale, an hour before we gavel in? Yeah, an hour before we gavel in. So if I'm there at 8 in the morning and we gavel in at 2, lobbyists can come on the floor, the public can come on the floor, and lobby me for any issue that they want to. Now, sometimes there's a little bit of a cat and mouse game there that goes on because you can be sitting at your desk and there can be a line of 15 people. And every lobbyist, I, well, they're, if they're reputable, they make their pitch in less than one minute and then they move on. And so that's the time that they really have with you. Now, if you step off the House floor, there's a lobbyist side and then there's a representative or a senatorial side that only family and you can be in when we are gaveled in. But if you step off the House floor, you're fair game. At that point, I mean, somebody can jump out from behind a pillar, gotcha, and then they, they get their time with you. Um, so th that's, that's always, you know, interesting depending if you're trying to avoid somebody on a, on a topic that you're not comfortable with or you haven't even decided yet. And I find most lobbyists are respectful when I say, give me the information. I need to talk to the other side. Come back to me in a couple days. Lobbyists are respectful that way. So then at that point, we gavel in. And if I have this bill from LRC, I hand it to the front of the House, the Secretary of the House. It gets read for the first time a couple days later. So Bill ABC doing this, this, this. It has to be read on a live mic. We're recorded. Everything is recorded. When we gavel in our committees, you can listen to them live. The floor. Um, PBS carries live feeds. I always walk down this one aisle every day because my husband, probably the only person watching, I wave to him. Uh, he calls it the walk by. And um, so at that point, the bill is read for the first time. And then what happens then is that the Speaker of the House, the man that stands at the gavel, which is Dean Wink right now, and he's from out here uh, on Highway 34. Big, he's a rancher. Um, he will assign it to a committee. Now. The House and the Senate have the equal number of committees, but the, remember, the Senate only has half the numbers. So those people can usually be assigned to three to four committees. Your committees meet on Monday, Wednesday, Friday. They can meet at 7 or 10. And then Tuesday, Thursday, the same time. I'm fortunate that my two committees meet back to back on Tuesday and Thursday, so I can usually stay home a night longer. I just have to be there to gavel in at, at 2 o'clock. Um, and then at that point, it's assigned to a committee. So as a chairwoman, I sit up in front of the committee, and I introduce a bill, and we do proponents, opponents, and then the committee at that point has our discussion out loud, and then we decide the fate of that bill. 
There's ways that they, they can be flushed out later on, but basically it's all those in favor say aye, all those opposed nays, secretary take the roll. And if the bill makes it out of committee at that point, it is reread again a couple of days later on the House floor. And when it's reread again, that's when the 75 of us get together and have the debate. Now, if I'm carrying the bill, I stand up and give the initial pitch. And the Speaker of the House recognizes people. And you have to stand up and get his attention. And for a short person, that's hard. Uh, so, but you have to be very loud. Um, and then at that point, if it makes it out of the House, then it goes over to the Senate and goes through the whole entire same process. It, yes? Does the speaker or who assigns it to, who decides on the committee assignment? The speaker does, and sometime, uh, sometimes I am mystified on the committees that he assigns them to. Um, I was on commerce and energy, and we got the death penalty bill. And I'm like, I suppose they're using energy to, I don't know what they're, I, he just, I was like, somebody segue me into why, you know, and, and, and I'll be, I was on, um, health and and I, I think they probably do it because there are a lot of tough votes that we take and you don't want one single committee to get every tough vote you want your caucus you want your group to kind of be able to um, not be protected but have a wider range of people that can talk on that subject um, I've been on uh, what what was I we were on a health committee and we got a gun bill and I'm like well I think the gun could end your health I don't I just that's just what happens. And so he does, he spreads them out, the tough ones. But a lot of it, really, to be quite honest, are um, the social issues are very hot topics. But a lot of it is, I was on tax committee, and that was a lot of dull bills. It was a lot of dull bills. And it was at 7 a.m. in the morning, so you'd just be sitting there like, kind of crossing your eyes, I need some more coffee. Um, so at that point, the process has gone through. And then there's what we call the second floor. That's the governor's office. The second and the third floor are at, not at war. We're all trying to do our job. The governor's office, some of the time, does not agree with what we do on the third floor. And so you have to remember, the governor's office has all of his departments and all of his heads of his departments and all of those people lobbying on behalf of Department of Health or Corrections. And so they're up there lobbying you also. So if the bill makes it off the House and the Senate floor, it then goes to the second floor. At that point, we've usually gone between 35 and 40 days. We come home and the governor gets two weeks to sign every single bill. And then the 40th day, the last day, is when we go back for veto day. So if the governor has decided that he does not like a bill, he can veto it. Then we have to come back on the 40th day, usually the end of March, and then we get to try to override his bill. And meanwhile, in those whole two weeks, you're getting a lot of phone calls, a lot of lobbying. Um, it's politics. It is. Um, so you, you definitely uh, got to be able to hold your own. It is not a, a game for. And I don't want to say that it's strong armed or we're not polite to each other, but it's politics and we are shifting the way the state of South Dakota thinks. What, not thinks, we're, we're pushing things onto you that you have to follow. And I'd like to think that most of the laws and things that we pass are for the betterment of all the citizens of the state of South Dakota. Um, but it's, you know, sometimes heavy as the head that wears that. I mean, it, it, it is. And I do, it, do, it is spread out over 105 people, but I have to come back to Cracker Barrels and answer for my votes. And I'd like to think that I've done my research enough where I can defend why I voted the way that I voted. My points of view has shifted drastically on, um, not drastically, I used to be very, very much pro-death penalty. That view is, is much more not like that at all anymore. Having seen, you know, parents come and testify. You know, the young man that was shot out here in the, ba in the bakery several decades ago. His parents come every year and testify in favor of the death penalty. And I mean, I left that meeting and went to my car and called my mother just bawling. And I'm a 45-year-old woman. So there are, there are some heavy moments, some intense moments. It is, it's a difficult job. Um, but obviously I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't put myself through elections and door-to-door -door and, and um, hold myself accountable if I didn't think that I was making a difference. Is there any more questions? I have one more. Go ahead. Well, 
how many uh, so how many bills are uh, get to that first reading? Every single bill has to have a committee hearing. Every single bill that's introduced. On a good year, uh, we usually go through 500 bills. 500 are introduced on average. Now we've had more. Um, when we've had more people, you know, some, I'll just call them passionate people, tend to bring bills. There was one bill that was brought one year that every 18, once every 18 year old registered to vote, they were required to carry a firearm. Um, okay. <laughs> no. My daughter's 13, no. <laughs> yeah, it, yeah, it's back to the holster business. I think some of the curiosity is about uh, how do you get legislation passed? So the, question, the big question is how many napkins are handed to representatives? How many of those make it to a first reading? And then how many uh, ultimately are by the government? The, the governor? governor um, I'm open to any, I've gone door to door, I'm open to anybody that, you know, I think that there needs to be a bill on this. There is sometimes some confusion about what should be brought locally and what should be brought countywide and what should be brought statewide. I had a feud between two women on the cosmetology board. They just did not like each other. So they introduced this legislation to dissolve the entire board. And they brought it to my Commerce Committee, and I was like, you just brought the family feud to a state level. Now, we have to address it because a bill was introduced. And so I just, at that point, said, I'm going to give you 48 hours. You people need to go into a room and talk this out. And, you know, there, there is some confusion there. All bills make it to committee. I'd say maybe six or seven out of ten make it out of committee. But then you can get on the floor and... and the rest of the, your caucus will be like, what were you thinking? I mean, this, this was a crazy bill. And you, you, know, you, you purposely didn't have the guts to vote it down in your committee. And you're letting us all take that hit on the House floor. So we have to go on record with the vote. So, um, and then at that point, what did we pass, Dale? How many bills out of the House and Senate this year? 200 and about half? Yeah, 237. Yeah, bills came out of the Senate, out of the House, to the governor and signed. Yes, Dale. Would you explain the difference between a bill and a resolution? Yes, I will. A resolution is an idea. A resolution is the idea that we send to Washington, D.C., saying we want you to pass a balanced budget. We have a lot of resolutions. You know, we want you to recognize the state of, we want to recognize the state of the country of Taiwan as a good trading partner. A bill actually goes into statute. It goes into the, all the, the hundreds, not hundreds, hun, well, hundreds of books that we have that list the laws that we as the state of South Dakota must follow. So it, there's one's kind of a suggestion we strongly want you to support this. For example, there was a conting, contingency of three because we had an ab abortion um, bill and they delivered it to Washington, D.C. Does, does Congress care? No. But you're on record as stating that opinion. I've never done a resolution. Yes? So are you comfortable sharing about what your, uh, your uh, shift was on that? You know, I, having kids is a crazy thing <laughs> because I find that you become more compassionate and before I had kids, I thought if anybody hurt my child, eye for an eye. Um, and I've gone on record now that I'm opposed to it. Um, but it, that is a hard pill for me to swallow. It really is. I, the mama bear in me wants to just, you know, I'll, I'll get back at you. I'll get you. If you take my child from me, I get you. But it's, it's a daily struggle, and Dale and I have had lots of conversations, as I have with, with people uh, in the Catholic Church. It's a hard one for me to swallow, but I do now. You shared on committee that you, know, you had you know, prayed about it at Mass, and you came out of Mass, and suddenly right. you had to do that. Forgiveness. It was a full life. You know, if I'm going to be involved all the life. Right. Forgiveness is, is, is hard. I think we all struggle with that. Um, but we all need it because we're flawed. We should have been here this morning to listen to the 
That was her story. She lost her dog. Yeah, forgiveness is hard. Especially for a stranger, hopefully at that point. But I would account that forgiveness to somebody that I loved. So I need to do it to everybody. So, yeah. Any other questions? Do you find that the bill goes to the committee um, and they, I guess they kind of debate it among themselves and decide whether it's something they, they want to bring forward to the entire body. Do you, do you find sometimes kind of listening to what their recommendations are to form your own vote or do you kind of have a preconceived? So are you saying, well, I've, I've usually done my homework, so if are you saying be, before I hear the testimony in committee? Because what's what happens is we sit in the chairs, and then we op I open it up for opon or proponent testimony, and at that point, twenty people could get up or one person could get up to give you the propon you know the pros and and then the cons get to get up at the end. And if you find that somebody's given a con point that the pro should address, I would say at this point I would open it back up to you, Mr. Johnson, so you can come up and refute. Um, if there was something said that I felt was incorrect or um, derogatory. Um, I usually have my point of view made up. But to be quite honest, a lot of it is dull as baking powder stuff. It's, it's, the social issues are always, you know, very high heated, very, very um, well attended. But you, you don't find a lot of people that, you know, care about. Well, I guess I was talking more about other committees that are not a part of. And what happens at that point is we have the Republican caucus. Our caucus is closed. We meet usually, depending on how many bills we have on the agenda that day, we meet an hour before. Um, it's The bill is discussed. I would stand up and I'd say, this is, you know, Mr. Leader, this is Bill ABC. Here's what the bill says. Here's what the bill does. At that point, somebody can stand up and say, these are the questions that I have, just so you're prepared on the floor, or these are the issues that I have, and this is why I'm going to vote no against it. But nobody ever says, we need you to vote this way. I've never been asked to vote in line with caucus. I've been asked to defend why I'm voting against it or why I'm voting for it. But it's, it's very, you know, they have these big old conspiracy theories out there that we all get together and we plot and we plan. It's just an information. It's usually a one to two minute speech. This is why I brought the bill, or this bill came out of my committee and I was asked to carry it, because agencies and departments are not in that caucus meeting. So if, if, if Department of Corrections brings a bill, they can't come and defend it or sell it, basically pitch it. And so that's, you know, sometimes you'll be given a bill and you'll be like, this is a doozy, I am not in favor of it, Department of Corrections wants it, but here it is. And then you'll say it, and then you'll say whether you're going to vote for it or not. But I was assigned it by the leader or by the chair of the committee. Sometimes I've had people in my committee that are uh, opposed to a bill. It gets out of committee, and then I'll tell the person that's opposed. I said I'm assigning it to you. And so I mean, you, you there is a little bit of leeway in there because I decide who assigns it as the chairwoman, who gets to pitch it. So it's you know it's a fair process. It's a good process. Some, you know, sometimes things are shake out well, and sometimes they don't. Go ahead. Um, are you able to speculate a little bit on what kind of bills that would be of interest to this group to come forward and get a commission? You know, I have not heard. Last year was not a lot of social issues. Um, but the typical ones come every year, more restriction to abortion. We've kind of started to tiptoe into an area that there are self-serving people that want to bring certain anti-abortion bills that really don't service, that, that were right to life got up and said, we don't like this bill. Um, so there's always going to be bills like that, right to life, you know. Um, pro-life bills to, to keep on limiting it. You know, we, I think we did pretty well with the, now the counseling is involved. Until the state of South Dakota citizens step up and vote it down, we're just going to keep on trying to chip away at it as much as we can. Um, you know, there's gambling. There's, it, every single year, there's the, the payday loan. There's, uh, what else, Dale? 
Human trafficking, that's a death penalty. It comes up every year. Yep, adoption is another one. Um, just, you know, things that, that a lot of bills that have to do with family values, family faith, personal choices. Yep. Defining, Dale and I were just talking about, um, and the reason I refer to Dale is because he, I see him every day and he lobbies a lot on behalf, behalf of Christian faith. Um, what was the other one we were talking about? Um, yes, they, well, they wanted to find transgender and what was the other one? Transgender bill. Um, that's another big one that will be fought. Yes, ma'am? State, but I have an interest in the process. Okay. How much does your constituency have a say in how you vote? Or do you just do your procedural thing that you've already described? I mean, do you take a poll of your constituency and say, they mostly want this, so I have to vote for it? My constituency, and I'm very lucky, is overwhelmingly Republican. Um, but I'm very honest when I go door to door on if you elect me, this is this is how I feel. Does it, you know? Yeah. Do I have some issues with the fact that one of my my hardest votes was has to do, had to do with female contraception not being covered by insurance. I think it should be. I mean, we're paying for Viagra, and so I wrestle with that one too. And thank goodness that hasn't come up in in five years, but. I do, I do have differences, and I have to say my mother is a Democrat. My father's, they're both check-writing Democrat and Republican. My mother's saving grace is that she's very Irish Catholic. <laughs> very Irish Catholic. As a matter of fact, she just took my husband and my daughter and I to see the Pope. Yes? Yes, um, what I haven't heard, I'm hard of hearing. What I haven't heard today is discussions of public education. Um, I'd like to give you some services based on what we know today. Luber then, we need to set that aside in this discussion. Secondly, we need to set aside the fact that uh, the Secretary of Education, Board of Regents have changed the early history requirement. It doesn't matter, we don't have history teachers who have to go around and All that, let's set those aside. I'd like to know your record on going to fund education. To vote, to, are you talking about specifically teacher pay? I'm talking about the formula and teacher pay. The formula is, and, and irregardless of what you think about the Blue Ribbon Task Force, the funding formula is being discussed right now. I will admit. I need to set that aside and talk to what your um, philosophy is and your voting On funding education? Um, I, I, I vote to fund education. Now what the school board does with the money, you don't want us legislating teachers pay. No, I don't. Yeah, and so what the school chooses to do with the money is different. And, and to be quite honest, I've never gotten an honest answer out of, out of our superintendent out here. I'd like a breakdown of where the money goes. I've never gotten a breakdown. I want, I want. I'm, where the money goes. And trust me, we're not paying for teachers, we're not putting enough money into the curriculum, we don't have enough teachers to teach things that are early in our industry, which would give the group here tools, along with the Constitution, to fight some of these life issues we've just issued. I'm going to shut up, this is not a good thing I told you, but when you go back to here, please, if you don't want to talk about your Thank you. I, my position is, I'm, of course, I'm pro-education, but I think there's also other components that need to be put into that, not just with the funding of teachers. Staying in the state of South Dakota is a choice. As soon as I graduated from USD, I couldn't get out of this state faster. It had nothing to do, I, I educated in a, in a Highly, I could have had a, a, a good job here, but back in the in the early 90s, that job paid fifteen thousand dollars. It paid fifteen thousand dollars in Minnesota. It was exactly the same. I chose to leave the state of South Dakota, and our youth will always leave the state of South Dakota. You have to choose. I was in Minnesota for 18 months and ran screaming back here. 
And I said to my husband, find a job, any job, let's get back to South Dakota. And so the premise that teachers leave entirely because of lack of funding, I, I, I find that there's a little bit of over-exaggeration over there. Um, you choose to be a teacher. I, I put teachers and nurses in the same category. You are a certain type of per person. You are a certain nurturer to be a teacher or a nurse. I couldn't do either. You wouldn't want me to do either. I am not wired that way. So uh, that we constantly, and I, and I agree with you on the education funding part. Um, we have been slow, and I said that before, on getting to funding certain areas. But we've also come off of uh, several tough years of having to cut every single department, of having to cut salaries. Um, and I, I want the, the school districts to take a, a little bit of ownership in the fact of, you know, we have like 14 princip uh, assistant principals here in town. Why? When I went to school, when you went to school, we had one principal, one vice principal, one counselor, and I understand I'm from Fort Pier, but there is there administrative wise, not education wise, but administrative wise, there is some accountability that needs to be had. That's where I stand. Yes. Um, I'm wondering for the group that's here, or, or other groups that feel like they really have an issue and that they would like to affect some kind of change. What's the best way to deal with your representative, or what's the <coughs> best way to communicate? You want my attention? Call me. Do not wait until I'm in peer. We go from sun up till sometimes 11, 12 o'clock at night. Not only do we do our job when we're in session, but then afterwards there are multiple, maybe seven to eight receptions that we go to. You just go from one to the other to the other, and people try to lobby you there, but you have to remember we're dealing with our constituents, 500 bills, our committee, um, lobbyists. Call me. I get phone calls at home. I'm in the book. I get a couple a week. Will you check into this for me? Can you check and see if the, you know where this legislation is? Most, you'll find that most people get back. Bulk emailing and bulk letter writing, you know, with the same exact wording, odds are you're not going to get any response. Call. A personally written letter, not a chain letter. Because I've gotten hundreds of letters on one topic and you open it. So, call. Mm -hmm. Yes. Chris, I, I just wanted to ask, do you know why the caucus is not open and would you prefer that it was open to the public? Uh, it's a lot less intriguing than you, than you think it is. I think it's, uh, it's important that, um, I, want, I do want it closed because there are certain things that I say in there. If I'm opposed to your bill, I, I will say, I'm going to tell this to you now. I am not going to say it on the floor, but this is... I, it's it's very procedural. Yeah, very much so. It's procedural, and let's be quite honest. The, ca the caucus is open. I mean, I I've gotten down on the floor from leaving the caucus and had a lobbyist come up to me because somebody has texted in the caucus. It's it's open. Um, does it look bad? Yes. But it's a place of you know refuge at a certain point before we go onto the floor. Is that it? Well, thank you. You've been most gracious, and I did not feel attacked for once. <laughs> so I appreciate it. That's because you're Christian women and men. Um, and if you do have any questions, I'm in the phone book. You can give me a call. Even if I'm not in your district, I, can, I do stuff in other districts, primarily Western South Dakota. Thank you. Great.